Hello, very good evening to one and all. Welcome to this edition of Fekushala webinar series from Johnson Johnson at the I Foundation Coimbatore. It's my privilege to introduce moderator for today's session, Dr. Chitra Ramamurthy. Dr. Chitra Ramamurthy is the medical director of the I Foundation group of hospitals spread across southern India. She is specialized in cataract, refractive surgery, and glaucoma. She has she has keen interest in refractive surgery and is a pioneer in this arena over the last two decades. She is widely known for her oratory skills and has been an invited and guest faculty of innumerable national and international congress. She has many awards to her credit for her exemplary work. She is now the member of Scientific Committee of All India Ophthalmic Society. Welcome, madam. Thank you. Thank you. So I hope I am audible. A very good afternoon to one and all of you. Uh, without any delay, we would uh, start off on our first speaker, uh, Dr. Raddi Ramurthy, who is going to be talking on the latest advancements in modern day monofocals. Before we go on to his talk, uh, I am sure he is known to all of us. He is the chairman of the Eye Foundation group of hospitals and the past president of AIOS. He is a strong academician and has been in the forefront to bring out the very best of the ever-changing technology landscape throughout no. the years. He is a renowned speaker and has chaired sessions, presented papers, guest lectures, instruction courses and has performed live surgery in many national and international congresses. He has various publications in peer-reviewed journals to his credit and has also been the recipient of the Achievement Award from AAO besides many other awards to his credit. So on to you, Dr. Ram Murthy. Let's have what you have to say. Good afternoon, one and all of you, and a very warm welcome to this series of uh, uh, lectures uh, brought to us by Johnson & Johnson, the Feko Shala series. And it's truly a great initiative in the sense that we can all be in the comforts of our workplace and still uh, touch base with each other. What we have laid out for you today afternoon is a series of lectures which is covering the gamut of uh, some of the latest developments in the field of intraocular lenses and I believe it will be a very interesting session. The good thing about it is that apart from the four speakers, we also have enough time for audience interaction. So I am aware that many of you in the audience are excellent cataract surgeons having undergone the Fikur Shala program and uh, I believe that uh, uh, you would be asking very relevant questions which you would be able to take up at the end of each talk and in the question answer session at the end of the um, all, all the four speakers. Uh, I, as far as my financial disclosure is concerned, I am the consultant to JNJ as well as Alcon and the product I am going to be talking about in this lecture is brought out by Johnson & Johnson. Uh, basically, today uh, the concepts are completely changed as far as cataract surgery is concerned. Today the current standards as far as cataract surgery is concerned is uncorrected visual acuity for all distances, not for distance alone but for near and intermediate also. And all of us know that the best quality of vision each person has at the age of around 20 and cataract surgery offers us an opportunity not just to enhance the quantity of vision but also the quality of vision and put back the vision around the, what they enjoyed at the age of 20, which, which is the time when they had the best quality of vision by addressing the spherical aberration, chromatic aberration, so many other factors. What we also need is immediate restoration of vision. So what we do has to be extremely friendly to the eye as well as to the patient. And today, because many of our pa uh, patients are undergoing their surgery, are they early 40s or they live well beyond our own professional lifetime, what we do today has to serve them very well for many decades to come. So today cataract surgery is not just vision restorative but vision enhancing. It essentially offers us an opportunity to leave behind the patient with a kind of vision he or she never enjoyed at any point of their lifetime. So for this we have multiple options today. Monofocals have been around for a long time. We have the diffractive multifocals, refractive multifocals have by and large gone out of the work. Uh, extended depth of focus lenses and extended uh, uh, range of vision lenses 
the symphony being an excellent example with which we all have a wide uh, experience is of course there. Apart from this, the trifocals is also there and because of their facility to uh, offer good vision for all distances, this seems to be a gateway to go. But obviously today we would not describe, prescribe glasses to any patient without correcting his presbyopia if he or she was beyond the age of 40 or 45. So why is it that we are even discussing about uh, prescribing uh, 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 what uh, Im implanting multifocal intraocular lenses or uh, extended depth of vision lenses? It's not just the cost alone, but the fact that uh, very often the quality of vision does go down once you implant any kind of multifocal intraocular lenses. Basically, as shown in this slide, which many of you might have seen earlier, uh, the, all these multifocal intraocular lenses work on the principle of simultaneous macular perception and that's the reason there is splitting of light. There are rays of light coming from distance and near. If you see in this ray, particular ray diagram, these rays of light are coming and from a distance, are coming and getting focused onto the fovea, which is essentially the signal. But then there are also rays of light from a near object, which is getting focused a little in front because the add power in this particular lens and they are divergent by the time they reach the retina. And that's the blur that you see around the light and that's caused the noise. So it is this signal to noise ratio which determines the quality of vision that these patients enjoy. And that is, it is this noise which essentially creates the dysphotopsia that we often face with multifocal intraocular lens implantation. And all the advancements in multifocal technology has been essentially towards reducing the noise and enhancing the signal. So depending upon which company slides you are using, basically you would find that uh, uh, almost all the multifocal intraocular lenses do give rise to some amount of dysphotopsia. And the complaints of our patients depend upon the neural adaptation which takes place in them. So why is it that uh, uh, we have to live with this dysphotopsia? It's because we buy vision for all distances using the currency of contrast when we, we talk about multifocal intraocular lenses. It's been our uh, experience that whenever we do something physiological, we mimic physiology, we get excellent results. Like when you have an opaque lens, we take out that lens and implant a natural uh, clear lens. When the intraocular pressure goes up, we bring it down. But multifocality was never in the scheme of things for any mammalian eye. And since either in the cornea or in the lens, that is the reason that whenever we try to introduce multifocal laser treatment onto the cornea or implant multifocal intraocular lenses, there is a price to pay by virtue of the deterioration in the quality of vision. On the other hand, we have this excellent monofocal intraocular lenses that have been available to us, which have been around for a long time. Even to this day, even in advanced practices, I think it's monofocal implants which are implanted in more than 80% of the eyes. Both the, when I refer to monofocal, it refers to monofocal as well as the monofocal toric version. So we have this, uh, what are the advantages of a very robust platform that all of us are familiar with, that is a technis intraocular lens. They have the aspheric design with a minus 0.27 Q value, which almost completely compensates for the uh, aspiricity on the anterior surface of the cornea. There is also a very high Abbe number in this lens because of this. The chromatic aberration is almost completely uh, um, reduced and the reduction of the spherical aberration and the chromatic aberration enhances the quality of vision. Because of the characteristics of the lens material, there is very little glistening, having crystal clear optics. The reduced chances of PCO both because of the material characteristics as well as the um, square edge of the posterior, uh, posterior square edge of the um, uh, lens. There is reduced capsule of phimosis, inherent ability to do that. But the fact remains that apart from the fact that these lenses became foldable, and aspericity was introduced in these uh, monofocal intraocular lenses. Very little has really changed as far as um, uh, monofocal lenses are concerned, as far as the optics, is con uh, optics are concerned, right from the year 2001. And uh, is there a possibility of enhancing the kind of lenses that are available to us by changing monofocal intraocular lenses? I think would it be possible to re-engineer the proven Technis 1 platform to gain some intermediate vision? I think with this thought process that 
the Technis Ihans lens came about and essentially I think it's a great way to go in the sense that it's a compromise solution between monofocal and multifocal intraocular lenses giving the best of both in the sense that it gives you good quality of vision at the same time giving you a fair amount of intermediate vision. Let's look at some more detail about these lenses. Basically, when I first used these lenses, one thing which struck me was the sense that I could not make out anything even under the operating microscope between the eye hands and the conventional monofocal lens, the conventional technis lens. And the difference is that it's a um, ultra microscopic change in the power from the periphery to the center where there is a mild change in the uh, unique the anterior surface because of which there is an improvement in the intermediate vision. Going on to the optics of this lens, there is a gradual power change continuously from the periphery to the center and this is what gives us a better intermediate vision. And the distance vision that this lens gives is comparable to a monofocal intraocular lens without any compromise as far as the quality of vision is concerned and the kind of dysphotopsia that we are experienced with the diffractive multifocal intraocular lenses. And essentially because of the Q value being minus 0.27 it reduces the spherical aberration to almost near zero in the conventional cataract surgery patients. The fact remains that except for a very gradual transition from the periphery to the center, almost 85% of the anterior surface of the lens exactly corresponds to the conventional Technis 1 lens which we are quite familiar with. So the um, main uh, factor that we need to keep in mind is this lens is not a zonal progressive lens that is it's not a refractive multifocal it does not have name any diffractive multifocals and at the same time there is no spherical aberration that's being changed on the surface of the lens because of which it almost mimics the quality of vision that a monofocal lens is, um, has and essentially whatever improvement in intermediate vision occurs it's because of the change in the very gradual change in the power from the periphery to the center of the lens. That is the reason when you look at the defocus curve what is shown here is in blue and that seems to be much wider compared to a Technis monofocal lens and it is this width of this uh, uh, particular lens the defocus curve which offers a much further, uh, larger sweet spot that allows us to um, get away with even small errors in uh, the implantation of this intraocular lens. Because of this wider sweet spot, even if the, we have not landed at absolute emetropia, the patients experience reasonably good distance as well as intermediate vision. But for the quality of vision to be good is extremely important that our biometry is good and we by and large arrive at emetropia once we implant these lenses. Just looking at a quick video of this intraocular lens being implanted, as I already mentioned, it's no different from the uh, monofocal lens, the Technis 1 lens. You can see that it's a 6 millimeter optic, 13 millimeter overall diameter, excellent glistening uh, optics, and it comfortably goes in through a 2.2 to 2.4 millimeter incision, and that's the intraocular lens being uh, implanted. And it's no different from the day-to-day -day single piece lenses that all of us implant and we are quite familiar with. That's one of the advantages of the, uh, this lens in the sense that any one of us can adapt it almost instantaneously once you are comfortable with FACO emulsification and implantation of more, uh, single piece aspheric lenses. We essentially did a very controlled study and uh, basically uh, evaluated evaluated the uh, both the near as well as intermediate vision you can see at 40 centimeters and 60 centimeters that it was done apart from of course the evaluation of the distant visual acuity basically we have been using these lenses fairly regularly but as a part of our initial study we had done a uh, total number of eight eyes bilateral implantation was done in two patients and the other were unilaterally implanted and uh, uh, we have a four months data on these eight eyes the rest of them being more recent, I do not want to go into the details. Some of the factors that I want to emphasize is that a couple of these patients already had a, um, one of these patients had bilateral technis eye hands implantation. And what uh, uh, was most interesting was that the uncorrected distant visual acuity was 6 by 9. And most importantly, the uncorrected intermediate distant visual acuity. In this lens, 
what we are looking at is uncorrected intermediate distance visual acuity. I would like to emphasize that was 2032 and 2040 and bilaterally implanted this patient could read 2020 at a distance of 60 centimeters and that is what this lens is uh, expected to achieve. And there were eyes where uh, the patient already had a technis 1 implantation and the second eye received a, uh, eye hands and these patients also uh, were quite comfortable for intermediate visual acuity. And this is what this is another patient where you find with the single piece I had a 2080 and the technis eye hands had a 2050 vision and then by these patients were also they were quite comfortable. The most important factor was that the average defocus curve that we saw in these cases was almost there was a minus 1.5 diopters of a broad plateau and that is extremely important. The vision that rapidly deteriorates beyond that but up to a distance of about 60 centimeters from infinity these patients seem to experience a very good visual acuity and that is what we are looking for when we are talking about intermediate vision. It was my uh, thought and some of my colleagues have told me that these patients do have some good near vision also. But I did not, uh, this is not our experience in the uh, limited number of that eyes that we did. These patients require almost about 1.25 diopters as far as near vision is concerned. Another thought process that might come to our eyes is, uh, our minds is why not use a mini mono vision that is make one eye um, minus 0.75 or minus 0.5 diopters uh, myopic and thus have steal some amount of near vision. That is also something that does not happen. Basically what we have to promote this lens is a, as a concept of giving excellent intermediate vision and in case the patient have, needs near vision, they need to be primed to the thought that they need the, um, some kind of readers that they can uh, use as add-ons. So as you can see over here with a minus 1.5 diopters of deep focus, almost all our eyes that we did, all our cases that we did maintained a 6.6 or a 6.9 visual acuity and that I think is a great way to go. But when the defocus dropped down to minus 2.5 diopters, you can see there is a fair amount of drop as far as the visual acuity is concerned. So I would caution you to the fact that when you use these lenses, please do not pro uh, promise excellent near vision. This is essentially meant for distance and intermediate vision. As far as you prime your patients for that, you will find that you are satisfying their needs, meeting their expectations quite adequately. And it is intermediate vision which is most important today I believe because practically as you can see for a 70 year old, it is not just computer vision or laptop vision that we are talking about. We must understand that many of our senior citizens do, are not using computers on a day to day basis all the time. But whether it is driving and including at night driving where there is no drop in the quality of vision but they can comfortably looking at the, look at the dashboard as, as well as the road ahead, reading price tags when shopping, watching TV including re reading subtitles cooking and eating, playing cards, reading at a computer, tablet or a smartphone which is often emphasized, playing a piano or feeling more confident while walking uh, because the, you do not have the uh, disadvantage of multifocality or all uh, um, concepts of good quality vision with a reasonably good quality of intermediate vision and I think that is something which will satisfy many of our patients. So essentially what is iHanser all about? It is not, it's not a multifocal intraocular lens, it is a modern or a super, super monofocal lens where you get all the advantages, all the good qualities of a monofocal intraocular lens with reasonably good intermediate vision or rather very good intermediate vision with a requirement for readers for near vision. It is not a substitute for multifocal lens and because as we saw in the deep focus curve it has a fairly broad um, uh, landing area. Even if you have small errors as far as, uh, um, as far as the biometry is concerned, these patients end up with reasonably good distant visual acuity and intermediate uh, visual acuity. But it is always a good idea to hit the target because th that is what satisfies our patients most often and also enhances the quality of patients that these patients have. The most important aspect of this lens is that the dysphotopsia that these patients experience is just comparable to monofocal intraoc lenses and you are not most often surprised with the kind of uh, uh, chat time that our patients demand sometimes after a multifocal implantation. So it is best to uh, counsel it as a monofocal intraocular lens. So what are my primary indications for this particular lens? 
I think you might have heard of uh, the features of this lens, talk, talked about intermediate lens uh, quite often. But the most important uh, thought that comes to our mind when we are presented this lens is, I already have such a large uh, array of lenses that are available to me, the extended depth of vision lenses, the monofocal lenses, the aspheric lenses, the accommodative lenses, the multifocal lenses, the trifocals. What is the new addition of a lens that has come up? Where do I exactly fit this in? I think uh, the, uh, I believe that every patient who goes in for a monofocal lens is a possible candidate for enhanced lens. So active person but not much reading requirements. My usual, uh, when I see my cataract surgery patients on the first post-operative day, when I give them an appointment, I ask them, do you want it one week later or six weeks later? If you are very much into reading, if reading is very important to you, then please come back one week later, I will give you glasses. Otherwise, I can meet you six weeks later. Most often what I find, except for some of those regular office goer, uh, workers in bank, most often these patients uh, tell me that reading is not so much important. Sometimes the spouse telling me, no, she, doctor, he or she doesn't read so much. We can very well come back after six weeks. So there are quite a lot of patients for whom reading is not so important. So if essentially they are looking at excellent quality of vision, excellent quality of life, but not too much of reading, and in case they are uh, uh, tuned to the fact that they might have to re do readers whenever reading is essential, we can go ahead and implant these lenses. And quite often it's my um, optometrists who do all the, um, all the, uh, what the, advice to these patients, by the time they come to me, they are already tuned for multifocal intraocular lenses. I do tell them that dysphotopsia is the price that you pay with these intraocular lenses. And essentially, because the glare hal halos is something some of you might experience. Some of these patients, when they hear that, immediately say that, doctor, in that case, I would rather stay away from multifocals and opt for a monofocal. These are exactly the patients I would tell them, I have a compromise solution for you. I would go ahead and implant this uh, uh, IHANS lens, which will give you extremely good intermediate vision, most often offer you freedom from glasses, but at the same time, in case you want to do serious reading, you might have to use readers. There are also other patients in whom we are averse to the idea of implanting multifocal intraoc lenses because there is always a price to be paid as far as drop-in contrast sensitivity is concerned. There are patients of glaucoma, the patients who have undergone prior refractive surgery, patients who have ARMD, where, who are thought to be less than optimal as far as multifocal intraocular lenses are concerned. These are patients, instead of monofocal intraocular lenses, we could offer a eye-hands lens. Just yesterday, I had a patient whom I had done um, uh, LASIK treatment almost 15 years back, came for cataract surgery, was extremely keen on uh, vision for all distances without glasses. But I advised her that it would be a good choice to go for eye hands lens because I was not um, willing to marry a multifocal cornea with a multifocal intraocular lens. I do believe that every patient of monofocal intraocular lens is a possible candidate for this uh, eye hands lens. And it's good that we have one more addition to the significant armamentarium we have as far as intraocular lenses are concerned. Thank you so much for kind attention. So. <coughs> That was a, a very informative talk to all of us. I hope I'm uh, uh, audible to all of you. Uh, there are some questions which we could ask Ramurti at this point of time, some of the questions which you all have posed. The first question is, how do you find the dominant eye before a cataract surgery? Uh, so basically, I think uh, we do, we're not looking at the dominance of the eye as far as uh, eye hands lens is concerned. This is a lens which has to be implanted bilaterally. But just in case you need to look at the uh, dominance of the eye, all you need to give a, is a uh, pinhole or a small hole in the paper and ask the patient to go ahead and see through one of the eyes. Invariably, they will take it to that dominant eye and look through that. That should give us a reasonable idea as far as the dominant eye is concerned. But I personally most often operate on the, whenever it's a question of dominance that needs to be handled, I operate on the eye with a greater amount of cataract, aiming at emetropia and having achieved, if I am on target, depending upon the comfort level with which they are able to handle different distances, I play around in the second eye. Because most often, in spite of our explaining the concept of dominance to these patients, they want the eye with poorer vision to get operated first. 
once you address that then you can implant the uh, um, adjust the power as far as the second eye is concerned the second question is the regular monofocals also have fair enough intermediate vision how does i how is i hands any different I think that's a good question because you know there are still we come across patients who have been who have got regular monofocals who come back to us and say that doctor when you suggest that they go for presbyopic glasses they say I'm quite all right I'm managing to read sometimes it's just that the reading they do is not too much but uh, more often it might be extremely small pupils it might be a question of significant amount of spherical aberration that they have. That's the reason when you are using aspheric intraocular lenses and completely compensating for the corneal aberration, near vision is the price they pay. And it could also be the diffraction that occurs at the edge of these pupils that could offer them some, some amount of near vision. But you all know that in a monofocal lens, there is a single power. And if in case they are enjoying a certain amount of near vision, it's because of one of these factors, they are just fortunate to have it. But in the, in the eye hands, is optically you are enhancing intermediate vision by adding a certain amount of power from the periphery to the center and that's the reason these these lenses are somewhat better than monofocal lenses when we are talking about intermediate vision the other question is uh, is technis enhanced uh, having any problems of glare and halos and is it suitable for drivers i think uh, i did address that during my talk basically the basic differentiating factor between this lens and the mono, the multifocal intraocular lens is that there are no diffractive rings, there is no variation in the spherical aberration of the lens from the periphery to the center, there is no zonal progression. Because of these factors, it almost completely mimics the monofocal lenses. If you ask me whether patients occasionally have problems of negative dysphotopsia with a monofocal intraocular lens, yes. But otherwise, these patients are likely to, uh, the quality of vision that they enjoy is similar to a monofocal intraocular lens and there is no compromise. Uh, there are some more questions but I think paucity of time I would have to go on to my talk which is going to be optimizing outcomes with premium IOLs and managing refractive surprises. Uh, we would try our best to deal with your uh, uh, questions if time permits. We look forward to a lot of audience participation which is how this uh, whole session is going to be of uh, a value addition to all of us. So my, my talk, uh, the first slide has been very beautifully explained by Dr. Ram Murthy that, that is today patients uh, not only want uncorrected vision for all distances, but they demand a quality of vision and something which would get them up and about the very next day and a permanency in this vision. So then there are certain challenges which are inherent. Essentially there has been always a, a thought in our minds about the previous generation multifocals and how they have performed. But there has also been an increasing knowledge that there has a lot of change which has come in the technology as far as multifocal lenses are concerned. So the surgeon needs to keep this in view when he sits across with his patient. But what has been interesting is that the patients have come to understand that there has been an evolution in the technology and they are very receptive to this change. So we need to work out the best balance, give that extra chair time and ensure that we have a satisfied patients with a satisfied visual outcome. I would be categorizing my talk in these different sections which has been which I am sure is seen by all of you. So the careful patient selection how you are going to be counselling them and how you need to evaluate right from the anterior to the posterior segment, how to ensure that we give them emetropic outcome which naturally mandates that the surgery is absolutely meticulous. The post-op care also has a role to play and of course how the modern technology has added strength to all of this. When we talk of pre-operative counselling, what we need to clearly tell our patients is that the dependence on glasses is definitely reduced, no doubt. But there is an associated glare when we are talking of these premium uh, multifocal patients. So we need to con uh, con explain to them that a bilateral surgery would be the way to go. If there is some residual refractive error, uh, a touch-up procedure might be needed, which should be done, which should be promised. And we need to explain to them 
that uh, a neural adaptation is always there which is going to come to our rescue. It is uh, something more effective in the younger patient but definitely a wait of up to two, one year should sort them out in most of these situations. The next category we need to talk to them after the counselling is that we need to understand that the problem has to be clear and safe from the ocular surface to the retina. In other words, we need to pick up those red flags which could be there in the whole track and ensure that we, these red flags are not included, those kind of patients are totally excluded when we are planning a premium IOL implant. It could be something as basic as a pre-existent dry air disease which has been missed, which has to be looked into and treated. It could be a dry eye which has got triggered by the cataract surgery itself, uh, some kind of a smoldering inflammatory process or the uh, medications which has disturbed the ocular surface. So we need to treat the cause before we take up these patients from a, for a premium IOL implant. We need to treat them with artificial tears. We need to keep them on immunolegatory agents which should address the inflammation uh, which is a long term one. We need to use punctal plugs to conserve those uh, limited tear production which is there in this older generation of patients. Sometimes a, a week or two of treatment of topical steroid drops ensures that that low grade inflammation is totally dealt with. Some of these patients need a more aggressive treatment for the mevomitis with lid hygiene and even a course of oral antibiotics would definitely help them through. We need to keep in mind that there are certain retinal disorders which could be something as simple as a, a maculopathy from a dioptic disease or a early epiretinal membrane or any old vein occlusion. It could be an ARMD which is evolving, a lamellar macular hole. Any of these things could have an impact on the final visual outcome and we definitely an OCT is absolutely mandatory when we are considering a patient from a premium IOL implant. I would say with the present day uh, information of uh, the by on behalf on the sub behalf of the patients, we owe it to practically all of them to do an OCT to rule out these problems or explain to them what is going to be their final visual outcome. As far as ensuring an emetropic outcome, we need to be sure that we do an accurate biometry and which is uh, something very feasible with the latest generation formulae which we have for a IOL power calculation. We need to understand that uh, amount of astigmatism is there is taken into account and we suggest the right kind of premium IOL for these segments. If there is a residual refractive error, it definitely needs to be treated once the eye stabilizes and we need to ensure that we are examining these patients on more than one modality if it is possible to realize that we have given, we have achieved the right kind of uh, optimal evaluation. I am not saying that the immersion biometers have gone, gone out of the market. They have a very major role to play. But if you do have an access to the optical biometers today, it is a definite step forward which brings in a greater promised accuracy. We need to keep in view that the increased uh, uh, the frequency at which the laser beam uh, falls in an optical biometer and how as against an A scan wherein it detects more of the paramacular and the macular region and there is a little variability in with the optical biometers, the, there is a precision with which the light falls on the fixation point. So in fact, the difference is about 200 microns when you are measuring with the uh, immersion biometers and the uh, uh, optical biometers and this has to be factored in if you want the most optimal results. You can see there are an array of technology which we have at our doorstep. We have different kind of keratometers, topographers, eye trace and more. What is most important is we need to be also clear that the anterior surface, the topography of the cornea is a regular topography and if it is an irregular topography, these patients would not do optimally with a premium IOL implant. Again, if we have access to eye trace, it will be able to tell us whether there are more abrasions in the cornea and this again would be not uh, very acceptable for a premium IOL implant. When you are doing a keratometer, you find there is a discrepancy in your results when you are measuring on two instruments. 
rather than getting flabbergasted over it, I would advise that you immediately think that there could be something there on the ocular surface and treat the ocular surface and then when you go back to taking your measurements, you find that you are more bang on in your evaluation. There are different kinds of uh, keratometers and topographers which are there in the market today and what we also need to know is each of these are measuring at a at different distances from the at the uh, from the central point so and the keratometric index is variable there are a lot of paraaxial assumptions which come into play and the most accurate way of measuring is measuring right onto the center of the cornea which is not possible this becomes even more challenging in a post refractive surgery eye wherein the central cornea becomes oblate or it becomes too prolate when it comes to measuring the next factor that is the astigmatism today with the amount of knowledge explosion which has occurred we need we have come to understand that we need to factor in the posterior corneal astigmatism we need to understand what is the role play of surgical induced astigmatism which had a very major uh, uh, role as far as astigmatism was concerned earlier on and we also need to know what is this toricity ratio which has to be factored in to get the most optimal results with the toric IOLs. So what we now understand about the posterior corneal astigmatism is that the posterior cornea is steeper vertically in 90% of the cases and this induces a power horizontally. In other words on an average understanding like if the anterior cornea is with the rule the posterior corneal astigmatism is roughly about 0.5 diopters and if the anterior cornea is against the rule it's on a rough understanding the posterior cornea would be 0.3 but we need to have ways of actually measuring it then going on with these average values so for this pentacam the galileys have all come into uh, gaining some stand but all of these need to be yet perfected and as far as uh, these are concerned, the Baylor's nomogram with its population average values and the Barrett's seem to have a greater understanding, greatest, uh, greater value. Today we have the IOL Master 700 wherein you are able to do what is called a measure of a total keratometry. In other words, you are able to measure the anterior corneal surface and the posterior corneal surface without having a mathematical model derivation of the posterior corneal astigmatism. The measurements here are done in three zones which is called as telecentric keratometry. There is also a swept source B scan measurement which is coming into play. In other words, there are three dimensional measurement wherein you are able to get uh, the accurate corneal astigmatism on the anterior corneal surface and the posterior corneal surface and then a new formulas or the Barrett total K or a TK universal 2 has evolved the Barrett TK toric which has been evolved which gives us even greater promised accuracy. What is this role of surgical induced astigmatism? If you now measure the values, enter the values of the amount of astigmatism or the magnitude and axis of astigmatism on a double centroid plot, you find that in most eyes which have the incision is 2.4 millimeters the, uh, or less this, the, these, uh, the actual magnitude of astigmatism is all only about 0.1 in other words all our earlier measurements of surgical induced astigmatism needs to go into the dustbin the other important thing which has surfaced is toricity ratio we all know that the amount of astigmatism on the corneal plane is actually being uh, addressed with the IO, with the intraocular lens placed on the IOL plane and this on an average the average of the astigmatism on the IOL plane to the corneal plane in an average eye has been found to be 1.5 but if you were to assume on this fixed toricity ratio it would be like assuming on a fixed effective lens position for a spherical IOL power calculation we are all familiar that the effective lens position changes based on the anterior chamber depth like it could be more in an eye which has a deeper anterior chamber or less in an eye with a shallower anterior chamber which could have a correlation with the axial length but there are whole lot of variables here. So by 
assumption of an average pseudo fakic i or an average toricity ratio therein creeps in some kind of an error because we need to be cognizant of the fact that if the iol is even sitting a little posteriorly in the capsular bag the iol power needs to be a little higher so there are so many variables which come into when you are actually trying to address astigmatism in its totality so savigny et al came up with this table wherein he plotted on the function of axial length to corneal power that if an individual had an axial length of 20 and a corneal power of 38 the toricity ratio is actually 1.29 whereas if an individual has an axial length of 30 and a corneal power of 48 the toricity ratio goes to 1.86 in other words the toricity ratio could vary anything from 1.29 to 1.86 and imagine the amount of error which would trickle in if we were to just assume a fixed toricity value in fact a shorter i and a flatter k would not end up getting overcorrected and a larger i and a steeper k would end up getting undercorrected so the need of the r is for us to understand and evaluate every single data in its complete precise values so the now we have the different toric calculators of the different iol manufacturers which account for the posterior corneal astigmatism the centroid value the effective lens position and the toricity ratio in fact the barrett toric calculator what it does is it uses the effective lens position from the barrett universal 2 formula and uses a mathematical model to calculate the posterior corneal astigmatism the amo calculator also has a way of a nomogram to calculate the posterior corneal astigmatism and it uses the holiday one formula for that so we need to understand that a whole lot has come in evolution different iol manufacturers have arrived at different ways of addressing these very essential factors to ensure that we get premium with our toric iol implant this is something which we need to always have in mind that topographer has a very important role and the corneal topography is irregular is ideal from a premium iol patient whereas if it becomes an irregular astigmatism these patients do not do well for a toric iol implant in other words you need to have a regular orthogonal astigmatism for uh, to plan a toric iol implant whereas in an early keratoconus patients who comes in for a to desirous to toric iol implant we need to be very clear with him that either we can do a topo guided surface regularization and then do a toric iol implant or you need to tell him that you are only going to debulk the toricity of the eye and maybe improve the quality of vision but you cannot promise him a premium vision we now have the very latest formulas which have evolved the generations which have come in and the barrett's now the barrett and the olson and the hill rbf are are in a position wherein they are able to not just measure a normal anterior segment but also measure all axial length to a small nano of till make i to a very large myopic i so the fifth generation formula which have come have all the data which are necessary to give us the precise answers which we need so the barrett universal 2 formula which has now the one other important advantage which it has is it also accounts for the varying principal plane among the different part iols in other words a low uh, hyperopic eye with a low positive meniscus lens to a negative lens is also taken into account and keeping this into account you are getting more ac accurate in your measurement of your effective lens position the process of astigmatic correction is even more it needs a preoperative attention to not just measuring the corneal astigmatism but accurately using the right formula to plan a toric iol implant it needs intraoperative attention to ensure that we use the right kind of device to mark to align the toric iol and lock it into its final position on the surgical platform and we need to have all the strategies so which help us in post operatively addressing the amount of residual astigmatism so that you send your patients as happy as you have promised him in the initial sitting so the marker challenges are you could do a free hand marking with your patient sitting right upright up to overcome the cyclo rotation 
but probably the more accurate ways to go would be to use the horizontal beam of the slit lamp and measure the 3 o'clock, 9 o'clock positions or you could use your bubble markers to achieve this or you could use a Mendelssohn's marker to go back intraoperatively to re ensure that the 3 o'clock, 9 o'clock positions are okay and then use a toric axis marker for the particular axis on which the IOL is going to be finally aligned or you could use your Varion uh, uh, imaging device wherein after the intraocular lens is implanted, sorry, after your intraocular lens is implanted, you could get your overlay, sorry, what is happening? You, the overlay would come in, which would, I can, I am sure you are able to see it, which helps you lock the intraocular lens into its final position after the viscoelastic is completely emptied and the IOL is ensured it is nudged onto the posterior capsule and locked into the final position. The causes of dissatisfaction could actually be clubbed into these six C's. A small amount of residual refractive error or a cylindrical part or if there is a posterior corneal opacity which needs to be addressed after a wait of 3 months to ensure that you give the right size opening. We need to look into the ocular surface. We need to see there is no sextoid macular edema which was pre-existent or which is there which could be the causative factor for the drop in quality of vision. We need to ensure that the IOL is well centered and most importantly we need to find out whether this patient is some with, some with over expectations which has to be toned down and maybe a greater amount of chair time is necessary. So talking about dealing with the refractive surprises which is the next part of my talk. One is all of which I discussed with you all along as to how you prevent a refractive surprise by being extremely accurate in each of these measurement steps or if it is a very small amount of refractive error, you could probably some of these patients are so happy that just prescription of glasses to be occasionally worn would suffice. But some of these patients would need each of these which I would try to address. Like when it comes to a residual refractive error following a toric IOL, more often than not it is that the, the uh, toric IOL has rotated and it is not in its position. So if you know that the cause of the residual refractive error is because of the rotation of the toric IOL, we, need, we can go ahead and solve this position. So it becomes necessary that we see these patients not just immediately post-op but even within a couple of weeks and see finally what is the I rotation of the IOL which is not a very common incidence at all and if so you measure three things. You measure the manifest refraction, the amount of astigmatism and the axis and you could enter it on the astigmaticfix.com and it would tell you how much is the rotation which is needed. You could use the Burdal and Harden toric IOL calculator results which would tell us what is the axis where you need to finally reposition your IOL and then what would be the residual refractive error which would happen even after the placement or today we have the Barrett RX formulae which gives us even precise information. It tells us how much to rotate the toric IOL if necessary. It tells us whether this could be adjusted by just adjusting the spherical and the toric part or it tells us that whether this patient needs a piggyback IOL. Like in this situation wherein those uh, imaging devices are not there, you could just mark the axis. It has told us that it, in this particular case it had to be repositioned in 60 degrees and then the uh, and after pre-play marking the uh, eye, you are able to just with the infusion on and without any use of viscoelastic, you are able to lock into this position. It could also be that you have, if you have a variant device, the image overlay comes in and here the implantation axis is 174 and what not what it was. So you need to just open up the incisions and then with the infusion on, you could just reposition it on the required axis and lock it into this position. It could be that the rotation of the IOL is not the reason for the residual refractive error wherein then you could use a Mendelssohn marker and mark the 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock and then also the cord lengths. Essentially when you are doing a, a limbal uh, LRI, you need to 
have different nomograms which are available which you have experience with which will based on the amount of astigmatism which will tell you whether you need to make a one arcuate incision or a two arcuate incision you could even use imaging devices which would makes it even more easy to measure the exact cord length and then uh, pre place our incisions or you could have a femto cataract platform which would help you to which would help you to uh, exactly place your arcuates you could use uh, your uh, uh, lasik device to correct the residual refractive error by using a microkeratome incision or you could use if the corneal thickness is not adequate you could do a transepithelial prk and treat the small amount of residual power essentially some of these small steps if it is done one if the patient has a residual refractive error they would be most happy uh, with these kind of solutions but we need to be cognizant of the fact that some of these patients are all of these patients are older patients and they already have a baseline dry eye disease so we need to be very sure that these residual refractive errors is something the patient is seeking to be treated at go ahead and treat if the amount of astigmatism is more you could place a piggy bag iol in these space by eyes we today we have the sulcoflex lenses with the indulating haptics which can be placed in the serially sulcus and essentially what we most importantly need to know that these ioles have to be positioned so that the axis at the right angles the haptics are at right angles to the way the original iol was placed and they have a posterior concavity which would ensure that there is the two lens surfaces are not uh, stuck to each other and there is no interlenticular fibrosis and in an extreme situation where the iol has been totally wrong we need to decide that we need to do an iol exchange so even that is quite simple we need to just hold on to the haptic of the iol and then just bisect it we need to need not bisect it all the way we need to of course ensure that the viscoelastic is adequate and you could just get the lenses out as has been shown to you and then go ahead and uh, position a new uh, another iol of the right part and bail the patient out of this problem yak yeah, capsulectomy as i had already said is something if there is a pco you need to make an adequate size opening but you need to be clear that you are not thinking of an iol exchange at a later date because you would have uh, taken away the uh, posterior capsule support altogether it could be that that i i something as simple as the i the diffractive rings of the multifocal iol has not been positioned appropriately and sometimes just a simple intervention in the immediate post operative uh, uh period of just recentering and uh, uh the lens would be all that is necessary we need to be cognizant that there are certain optical challenges like if an eye has a large angle kappa or an a uh, large angle alpha these eyes should not be taken for a premium eye implant and for this we have the eye trace and the other devices which tell us and something what we need to remember that any value of more than 0.5 angle alpha or angle kappa are not ideal candidates for a multifocal io implant because the optical alignment is not accurate there is a theoretical possibility of uh, placing uh, doing a laser iridoplasty to recenter so that you are able to retract the iris tissue to expose more rings and this is a case wherein uh, the the patient came with a decentered multifocal io and on opening uh, in opening up the incision and trying to readjust it found that the haptic of the io was actually broken and in, as you can see so all that you need to do is just remove this iol and place another iol we need to be cognizant that some of these patient could have dysphotoptic symptoms which need to be addressed and this was well alluded to by dr ramurthy in his talk because we need to understand that multifocality is not a physiological condition and some of these patients do settle down with neuroadaptation and in an extreme situation a negative dysphotopsia could be treated with a a piggy secondary piggy back iol we need to understand that a multifocality is a trade off to spectacle independence with dysphotopsia and these have to be extremely well balanced some of these simple remedial measures is like putting a, a pilocarpine eye drops in the evening before the patient goes on a long drive or keeping the dome lights of the car on or treating these small residual errors is all that is needed and iol exchange is probably the last of, uh, thing which is to be kept in view but that might have to be resorted to last but not the least the post operative regime has to kept be kept in mind that the regimen is as simple as is possible we actually use vigadexa for just 2 weeks 
and treat the patient with Nevanac for six weeks at plenty of artificial tears which is carried out. And if in a multifocal eye, you could do a micro monovision treatment by titrating the results of the second eye. Paucity of time, I am not going to be going into the details of uh, all of these. Uh, but uh, what is most important for all of us to take in mind is that finally, if you, before you address all that you have with your patients, what you need is that extra chair time to let the patient know that you are very concerned with the patient's problem and if you deal with it, you are probably already on the road to having a more satisfied patient. Thank you very much. I think uh, the talk turned out to be more longer than what it had to be. So, uh, I am sure there are certain doubts which you have to ask. We could deal with it. But before uh, that, I thought I would ask our speakers to give their talk. And our next speaker is going to be Dr. Shreyas Ramurthy and he is a consultant of cornea, cataract and refractive surfaces at the Eye Foundation Coimbatore. He did his MS from Arvindai Hospital and Postgraduate Institute of Ophthalmology and, uh, at, uh, uh, and uh, did his fellowship at LV Prasad. He is a clinician with strong academic background, has been awarded multiple gold medals with, for his academic excellence. He has more than 22 major publications in peer reviewed journals and has been a faculty at various national and international conferences. And uh, on to you Shreyash, he is going to be talking to us on selecting the right IOL solution to suit the patient's visual expectations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon everyone. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Johnson & Johnson for this uh, opportunity. where essentially we are trying to mix and match uh, different types of multifocal lenses to suit the needs of our patients. So I will just run through what options we have today and uh, how, how each option differs from the other and subsequently with the, uh, two or three case examples on how we can uh, use one type of multifocal in the other eye and another type in the, other, in, in the uh, fellow eye. So where does this all come in? Essentially, with the uh, modern day demands of the patient where you have patients who want to uh, do all their uh, near activity at home, be able to use uh, a computer very comfortably at work and as well as have a very active lifestyle, go holidaying, do all kinds of normal activities. So with the demands, growing demands of these modern patients comes in the need for being able uh, to give them good vision at all distances across the visual spectrum. So what are the options that we really have? We can either put in a monofocal lens with a monovision targeted in the other eye. But unfortunately with a monofocal lens, you would have to give a fairly large amount of monovision. This will definitely compromise both their distance visual acuity as well as their binocularity. With regards to multifocals, you can implant a, a bilateral similar powered multifocal in both eyes or you can have a higher add multifocal in one eye or, and a lower add multifocal in the fellow eye. Or you could implant a EDOF lens which is the symphony lens which, uh, where you can implant it in both eyes, where you can target it for emetropia in both. Or you can have symphony in one eye with a micro monovision with leaving behind a 0.5 to 0.75 diopter of myopia in the, uh, in the fellow eye or the uh, non-dominant eye. What's uh, new and what we are really trying out more often nowadays is using a Technus Symphony lens that is an EDOF lens in one eye along with uh, a lower add multifocal in the opposite eye as well. So, so many options are available to us today and how do we go about uh, choosing them. Before I uh, go into it, we will also discuss what are the challenges which we face with each of these multifocal lenses so, so that we can uh, discuss them subsequently in the examples as well. So the issue really is in any multifocal lens where we are having a light distribution towards uh, distance, intermediate and near, there is a certain light which is being manipulated and therefore there is a trade-off. There is a trade-off in contrast sensitivity, in visual quality and of course depending on the power of the lens, the range of vision. And each of these multifocal lenses, be it right from our uh, olden day refractive lenses which had multiple foci to the modern day diffractive lenses which have just two foci 
the objects which are out of focus that is the light which is being projected from uh, the out of focus images uh, introduces these halos and this is a feature of all multifocal intraocular lenses. To reduce this came in the first option which we have which is the uh, symphony lens uh, and because of its proprietary Echelet design and its achromatic technology, it was able to reduce the amount of uh, uh, photic phenomena as well as enhance the contrast sensitivity. This Echelet design ensured that there was a continuous range of focus. So the amount of stray light or the image being, the light being projected from the out of focus images was reduced because of a continuous fo uh, focus being available. The ad other advantage that is the MTF scores again which is related to the property of the IOL as well that the contrast of this EDOF lens was extremely good and was comparable to that of a monofocal intraocular lens. So the quality of vision was extremely good with the uh, symphony intraocular lens with minimal photic phenomena so that even patients who are uh, uh, doing occasional nighttime driving and are having an active lifestyle have good vision across ranges but at the same time do not have are not as disturbed with the photic phenomena and also have an excellent uh, quality of vision with minimal drop in contrast sensitivity. This is also a lens which we are occasionally preferring when the odd post LASIK patient really wants a multifocal intraocular lens. The re reason is post LASIK you have a drop in contrast sensitivity and any multifocal lens is also going to introduce a drop in contrast sensitivity as well. But the uh, EDOF lens introduces the least amount of drop in contrast sensitivity and is probably best suited for these post LASIK patients as well. But the disadvantage which we have with the EDOF lenses is that while it provides excellent intermediate and distance vision quality. At times, it is found wanting in patients who want excellent and crisp near visual acuity at 30 or 33 centimeters, which they were so used to when they were earlier wearing their progressive glasses. So to, the, uh, to address that comes the choice of multifocal uh, lenses which we have available today, the diffractive bifocal lenses which comes in various ad powers. First is the 4 diopter ad intraocular lens plane. Now at the intraocular lens plane with the 4 diopter ad it translates to about 3 to 3.25 at the uh, spectacle plane. This gives excellent near and distance visual acuity. But however the intermediate vision is compromised and any patient who wants a good vision across ranges will not be as happy if binocularly implanted with a plus 4 ad lens. So therefore the other options that we have is a low ad multifocal where we can mix and match putting a high ad multifocal in one eye and a low ad multifocal in the other eye what we uh, the so called blended vision. These low ad multifocals the 2.75 or 3.25 will uh, translate to about a 2 or a 2.5 at the spectacle plane and therefore gives excellent intermediate uh, visual acuity. Again bilaterally implanted these lenses may not give you satisfactory near vision but when one eye with a high ad and other eye with a low ad will give you an excellent quality of vision across all ranges of distance. Going into the defocus curves themselves uh, basically the, uh, the re reading distance is brought about by the uh, ad power which is pre present in the lens. As you can see here the plus 4 ad is probably best suited for a 33 centimeter reading uh, and has the multiple rings in the lens. The lower ad lenses the 3.25 and 2.75 have a progressively longer reading distance of 42 and 50 centimeters. So you have a single peak. Uh, for uh, distance and then you have uh, subsequent peaks that is either at 50, 42 or 33 centimeters depending on which type of ad uh, lens that you are using. Now the type of ad that you might be using will definitely depend on the reading distance that the patient is used to which is also sometimes a function of the height of the individual, taller individuals tend to have a slightly longer reading distance as well as the profession that the uh, patient might be into. A person who is predominantly using uh, computers requires a, a reading distance which, which can be a little further away and they might be able to compromise a little bit on the near reading ad but for a better quality of vision. Lesser number of rings also induces a lesser amount of uh, a photic phenomena and that might be an additional advantage by the low ad uh, lenses that are available today. Contrast these defocus curves with that of the symphony where you will see that 
after the peak for the distance rather than dropping off like a monofocal lens or a drop and then another peak which we have in the standard diffractive bifocal lenses here you have a continuous range of focus which is available for about a diopter and a half of defocus and this gives them that continuous range of vision starting right from about uh, 60 centimeters onwards to infinity the, the patients are absolutely comfortable when it comes to this techno symphony lenses and added to that in our study for about uh, initial 100 eyes with bilaterally implanted symphony we found that the amount of photic phenomena with hair uh, halos glare or starburst was extremely low so i'll just quickly move on to, uh, to a couple of uh, case examples and how we use these lenses so this was a patient who had a symphony lens done in the first eye and as you can see here, this patient required uh, about a 0.5, he was, though he was extremely comfortable for distance vision and uh, as you can see here 6.6 for distance and extremely comfortable for intermediate, he wanted a small amount of uh, ad power to be able to read comfortably. So these are patients where rather than going ahead aiming at emetropia in the other eye, where we do what we call a micro monovision. So we aim at a small uh, uh, myopic uh, error of about 0.5 to 0.75 diopter. Anything more than that will definitely cause a little more of uh, photic phenomena and you don't want to extend beyond that range. So 0.5 to 0.75 is probably the sweet spot and you would uh, do well to target a myopy of 0.5 to 0.75 diopter in these patients and they do quite well. Another quick example, now this is another patient who had good distance vision but you can see was only N12 for near. Intermediate vision patient was quite happy but required a plus one add. I found that especially when patients were previously myopic to begin with, these are patients who are quite unhappy with even the standard EDOF lenses because they are used to a very close working distance. They are used to extremely good uh, near visual acuity even before uh, surgery, even without glasses they would have been very very comfortable. These myopic patients are definitely where you have implanted the EDOF in the first eye. They would definitely do well with a plus 4 ad in the opposite eye. And this plus 4 ad in the opposite eye gives them an excellent uh, quality of vision for near. So now we have discussed two major options. That is a high ad multifocal and a low ad multifocal. In, uh, that is the high ad multifocal in one eye plus 4 ad in one other eye and either a 3.25 or 2.75 in the opposite eye. Or the other option which is using a EDOF lens in one eye and a lower ad multifocal in the opposite eye. So let us see how this works. So there are a couple of studies which are available in this study where they looked at a slightly higher ad in one eye and a lower ad multifocal in the opposite eye and they found that the results uh, as expected the uncorrected distance visual acuity was very good, the near was also extremely good. With intermediate however, there was a little left to be desired where uh, still only 66% of these patients were able to achieve 20 by 25 vision. Contrast that with a EDOF lens in one eye and a multifocal lens in the other eye where the satisfaction levels greatly increased and not just for distance and near but the intermediate as well where 97 percentage of patients were extremely happy for intermediate vision as well. So this has actually become a standard practice in our setup as well where if we are doing a, a symphony lens in the, uh, in the first eye and we look at the patient's uh, near visual acuity at about one week post-op and at that time if the patient is quite happy with their near vision we go ahead with just a micro monovision in the other eye but if the patient is a little dissatisfied we go ahead with either a plus 4 or a plus 3.25 add multifocal in the other eye and this takes care of the near vision while still maintaining an excellent level of intermediate and distance vision. I'll just close with this example looking at uh, the importance of astigmatism. Again, any patient uh, who may have some amount of astigmatism in their anterior cornea deserves to be put through the toric IOL calculator. Whichever IOL calculator you might be comfortable with, we must put them through it and see if they would benefit through a multifocal toric lens. And it does definitely vary when it comes between an against the rule and a with the rule astigmatism. This was a patient who had just about 0.8 diopter on the anterior cornea and we probably felt it was not necessary and we went ahead with uh, a, a standard uh, uh, multifocal lens and not a multifocal toric and you could see that the patient was quite unhappy for distance and had only 618 vision for distance and only with this correction was able to achieve a 6.6 vision. So 
looking at the other eye which had a very symmetric amount of uh, 0.8 diopters of astigmatism, you could see that the patient required a T3 or a T4 type of uh, uh, toric lens for correcting this amount of astigmatism which you might have quite easily ignored. And this patient subsequently once the other eye was done became quite happy for uh, all ranges of vision especially when it came to distance vision. So it's extremely important that we run all our patients through a toric IOL calculator and see if there is a certain amount of posterior corneal astigmatism or an against the rule astigmatism which might be exacerbated by the posterior corneal astigmatism and these are patients who definitely deserve a multifocal toric. Because anything more than a 0.75 diopter of astigmatism, definitely the amount of the quality of multifocality degrades. With the rule astigmatism, however, even with about 0.75 to 1 diopter, we can be a little more uh, lenient. As you can see in this example, despite a 0.75, the, uh, uh, the toric IL calculator does not suggest uh, any toric multifocal which needs to be placed. So, to sum up, we need to customize the choice of multifocal IOLs according to the needs of patients. We can definitely mix and match between the EDOF and multifocal lenses and the patients are quite happy. And always we must address the astigmatism component in these patients uh, to ensure we have optimal outcomes. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Shreyas. Uh, that was a, a good detailing of your talk. Uh, we shall go on to our last speaker, Dr. Tamil Larsi, uh, after which we will try based on the time to answer some of your questions. I did go through your list of questions, they are very relevant. We will see how we are able to do the paucity of time. Tamil Larsi is our consultant at the I Foundation and after completing her MS in 2007, has been uh, working in the cataract and IOL services at our hospital. She has presented in various uh, conferences and has done instruction courses on managing intraop complications, IOL part calculations, has done a lot of SICS and phaco emulsification surgeries brilliantly and is uh, trained in uh, dealing with uh, most premium uh, IOLs. She has a keen interest in teaching and has actually a very rich experience in shaping up young ophthalmologists. Uh, on to you Tamil, let us hear what you have to say. And her talk is going to be on pre-operative and special situations to consider for optimal visual outcomes. Thank you, ma'am. I actually congratulate uh, Feko Shala Johnson & Johnson for this initiative. Uh, my talk will be on pre-operative considerations and special situations. Dr. Harold Ridley, who implanted the first intraocular lens, lived to see cataract surgery evolve into a true refractive procedure. Today, I will be talking how to maximize our outcomes and include brief discussions of specific types of challenging eyes. Whatever eye it is, either it is a long eye, short eye or a post-refractive eye, but the most important thing is to do a meticulous pre-operative workup. The three important C's to look into is corneal health, careful biometry and the choice of formula. This is one example where a dry eye can make your biometry measurements very inaccurate. When we look into this biometry, we can see the right eye has only a 0.5 diopters of astigmatism whereas the left eye it shows 2.87 and this reflects in the IOL power where there is around 2.5 diopters of difference between this eye. So on examination, the patient tend to have severe dry eyes and the patient was put on plenty of lubricants and once the corneal surface is tuned up, we get more accurate results. Here post after uh, treating the dry eyes, the patient had 15 diopter of lens as equal to the other eye. Another thing is anterior segment examination has to be done thoroughly, look into the cornea and look for any gutte. Here in our institution we do a speculo microscopy for all our patients and if at all there is any fuchs underlying dystrophy, we can care, we can take an extra care so that we are not going to damage the corneal endothelium further. And we also assure the patient that they may require an endothelial keratoplasty later. So if anything that would show up later in the post-op results, both patient and the surgeons are aware of it. This is another example where the importance of OCT comes into play. This is a patient who had a nucleus sclerotic cataract both eyes and with a thin ERM. The OCT showed with the ERM with a vitro macular traction and the patient has been planned a combined surgery and post-operatively he did very well. Uh, this is another case example showing a uh, biometry of a patient planned for the right eye cataract surgery. The IOL power was same in both eyes, but a closer look revealed that the patient had a flat K in one eye. 
on further probing, the patient said that there is a history of LASIK done 30 years back in the right eye. So the mode and the formula is, is then changed in the biometer and the IOL power was calculated. So all these case scenarios just tells us that we should look into the validation guidelines. So when there is an asymmetry between the eyes of in with regard to axial length, uh, K reading and the IOL power, we should always recheck it again and if needed reconfirm it with another device. And now coming to the IOL calculation formula, these formulas fall into two major categories. One is the theoretical formula which was derived from the principles of geometric optics. Another is the regression which is generated by averaging a large number of post-operative results. Depending upon when they evolve, we have a five generations of formula. But the logical approach of classifying the formulas is to based upon what data they take and what is their method of calculation. The first is a historical which is obsolete, the second is regression and third is virgins based upon this geometric optics and depending upon what all the variables they take into calculation, we have two variable 3, 5 and 7. It does not mean that once we take a la more variable we are going to get an accurate outcome but we are going to we have to take the right variable to get the correct outcome. The third, the fifth, fourth one is the artificial intelligence which is the example is the Hill RBF which is purely data driven. The last is the evolving ray tracing method. Then the question comes how are the new formula different from each other? The effective lens position. The important goal of all these formula is to continuously improve our ability to predict the effective lens position. This is the distance between the anterior corneal vertex and the implant's optical center. We require certain measurements like axial length in keratometry to predict the effective le lens position. So all these formula differ in how accurately they predict the effective lens position. Most surgeons are aware that the recent formula are capable of producing more accurate results. But many surgeons continue to use the older formulas. To understand how much difference switching to an advanced formula, it is important to look at our outcomes. Uh, this is a database of Warren Hills where he analyzed, uh, he has a quarter million uh, post-operative surgical outcomes of all the surgeons. When he analyzed between the old versus new formula after removing all the outliers, he could see that only 78% of the surgeons could achieve within a 0.5 diopters of a target refraction and only 1% of the surgeons achieved this 0.5 diopters. But with the newer formula and newer biometers, 90% of the surgeons could achieve the same. So what was achieved by only 1 to 2 percent, now 90% of the surgeons could achieve a 0.5 diopters of the target refraction. So we must move to the newer formulas. This is our own results where with the third generation formula we could achieve only around 80% of the eyes with point, within the 0.5 diopters. But switching to the Barrett universal formula, not even in normal eyes, even in short eyes, we were able to achieve a 90% accuracy of within 0.5 diopters. So our standards are pretty much the Barrett Universal 2 formula. Should we plug our numbers into multiple formulas and compare the results? For normal eyes, this is purely optional. Surgeons who are using the newer generation formulas need not do this. But in problem eyes, challenging eyes like extremes of axial length and post LASIK, it is better. We can plug our details into multiple formulas. But while choosing the formula, we should choose what is well suited for that eye. If you are going to deal with the extreme myopes, we should take into account of the Barrett Universal 2 or Hill RBF or a Bangkok modification of the third generation formula. But if you are not going to choose the formula which is not going to well suited for that type of eye, it is going to just add a mathematical noise. Will we have ever one formula that works for the every eye? First, we should understand this dimensional matrix of the uh, human eye. 76 our percentage of our population have normal axial length with normal anterior segment, 9% are hypermetropes. Out of this 9%, 7% of the people have normal anterior segment and out of the 15% who are myopes, 13.5% have a normal anterior segment. But a third generation formulas assume that long eyes always have steep case and a larger ACD. This is where the error comes. And as has already been talked about, the, the newer formulas perform better. Barrett's Universal 2 formula takes into account of the five variables which has been already alluded to. Another newer generation formula is the Hill RBF. This is a purely data driven. The first version of the Hill RBF formula was optimized for IOL powers between plus 6 diopters to plus 30. The beta version which is the extended version extend the IOL power as far as minus 5 diopters. 
This is an ongoing project. It means that more the data is entered, the greater the depth of accuracy. When we look into the first picture, where the first the data was around 300, uh, around 3,500 eyes, when we put into the data, this red color circle mark it tells that our reading is out of bounds. Out of bounds meaning the Hill RB of database does not have adequate data to give an accurate result. And when it has moved, the beta version which had more of the eyes, it is around 12,500 eyes. Now the previously out of bounds now turns into inbounds. Inbound calculation means that it has enough data to tell that the predict prediction accuracy of the eyeball power is accurate. What is the best way to deal with a very short and long eyes? The problem with short eyes, even the best formula can run into trouble in this short eyes. These, there are many reasons. One is like even a small error in the measurement can is going to give a larger refractive surprise. Another, we don't know whether the short anterior segment is, is, is an anatomical feature or it is because of the increased lens thickness because of aging or cataract. All this puts into a trouble of difficulty in predicting the effective lens position. And this larger power IOLs, even if the effective lens position moves little bit anteriorly, it is going to give a larger myopic surprise in the post-operative period. This is one study which have analyzed all the seven formulas ranging from the newer formulas and also the Hoffer Q Holiday 1, 2. And it is shown that there is no statistically significant difference in the mean absolute error predicted by all the seven formulas in the short eyes. Another thing is like we have a high powered IOL, so what is the choice whether we are going to do go with a customized IOL or the piggyback IOL. The problem with customized IOL if we have any risk of biometry error then we are going to fall short back. The piggyback IOL option is like we can implant the maximum power available and then post operatively we do the refraction and then calculate the power of the piggyback IOL. The challenge in the long eyes is extremely different. Here. The problem is how to measure accurately the axial length. In case of staphyloma, in an immersion A scan, you are not going to get a distinct retinal spike. And the immersion biometry is going to measure the anatomical axial length rather than the refractive axial length. The optical biometry assumes that an average index of refraction and so it erroneously calculates the axial length to be longer. So when you are going to use optical biometer with a third generation formula, we have to use the wong cap modification or else we can go else go ahead with the Barrett Universal 2 formula or the Hill RBF if you are going to get inbounds calculation. Coming to the post refractive surgery eyes, first we understand what is the problem and what is the accurate way. The problem all threefold, one is the keratomatic index error, second is the instrument error or the radius error and third is the formula error which extrapolates the effective lens position. The keratometric index error is that the keratometer measures the anterior corneal radius of curvature and it uses the keratometric index of refraction which is 1.3375 and it calculates the total power of the cornea using this formula P is equal to N minus 1 by R and it assumes that the anterior to the posterior corneal curvature is constant which is 82 percent. But this percentage alters after a refractive surgery either it be LASIK or the RK. The second is the instrument error. Most of our keratometers and topographers are blind to the exact center of the cornea. They measure the paracentral area and extrapolates and gives us the central corneal power. This instrument error or the radius error comes into play when the, when the optical zone is small or decentered. All this keratometry error problems it leads to a underestimation of a power after post classic and a post, -hyper, post operatively a hyperopric surprise. Coming to the formula problem. The third generation formula calculates the effective lens position based upon the corneal curvature. Since here after a LASIK, myopic LASIK we get a, a flat K, we are going to err, err in the effective lens position calculation. So one solution was suggested by Aramberry where he suggested that to use the pre LASIK K for calculating the effective lens position and the post LASIK K in the virgin's formula for calculating the IOL power. So the solutions for estimating the corneal power one is the total keratometry and you can use a topographer like Pentacam and the Galili. The total keratometry has already been talked about. It gives the total corneal power by using the telecentric three zone keratometry and the Svepso OCT. The Pentacam, the holiday 2 report which gives the equivalent keratometry and this 4.5 mm at the region of 4.5 mm which can be used in the holiday to consultant program or we can use this pentacam 4 mm zone value of the total corneal power and use it in the ACRS calculator.
The next is the Galilee's 4 mm total corneal power which is calculated using ray tracing that it measures the anterior corneal surface, posterior corneal surface and also the pachymetry. It takes into account of the corneal thickness and it uses the actual index of refraction of the interface and it gives the total corneal power which can be used in the ASRS calculator. The formula error, what formula to use? We have multiple formulas which has been suggested depending upon the availability of pre-op K, surgical induced change in refraction and it is very time consuming to understand and apply all this in a day to day practice. This is made simplified by using the ASRS calculator. The previous version of the ASRS calculator uses there are three groups of formula. One that uses the change in the manifest refraction and the pre-LASIC K. Another second group that uses only the change in manifest refraction and the third group which does not use prior data. When you look into this article the clinical history which was once considered gold standard but it produced the accuracy of less than 60 percent of eyes within 0.5 diopters. So the initial that clinical history which is the pre elastic K and the change in manifest of refraction the first group of formulas were removed from the ASCRS calculator and now we have only these two the one with the change in the manifest refraction and one that uses no prior corneal data and this is available in the APS ARS website and we have for myopic classic where you can enter the pre elastic data the refraction reading after 6 weeks of the LASIK, topographic reading and the biometry reading and we are going to get the IOL power. Similarly we have for hyperopic classic and of much importance is this the Barrett true K formula which performs better when compared to the other formulas. The mathematical formula behind this method has never been published and we assume that it calculates the modified K and provides the double K solution which is available in the APSRS website. And this is also available in the IOL master 700 and once you change the mode to LASIK the particular type of LBC mode whether it is hyperopic, myopic or RK we can get the IOL power. This is our own experience with the ASRS calculator and the Barrett true K formula where we found that Barrett true K formula outperforms the even the ASRS calculator and it gives around 88 percent of the accuracy within 0.5 diopters. And it has been shown that it performs even better than the Hexel formula. Radial keratotomy, the challenge is difficulty in determining the true corneal power due to the irregularities induced by RK incision and even intraop aberrometry because of the change in the corneal incisions during cataract uh, phaco emulsification, it is also less accurate. So the, the key concept is measure close to the center and we can use this ASRS calculator for prior RK. And the thing we have to consider is postoperatively these patients will have transient hyperopia and it takes around 2 to 3 months to settle back. So wait until the pre it returns to the pre-op K value. This is one case example of a patient who underwent RK and for the first time we calculated the um, values the axial length and K using the lens star and we fed into the ASRS calculator and the average eyeball power was around 24.65 and so we implanted 24.5 diopters. As you, see, as you see here the right eye had immediate post-op a hyperopic error of plus 2 diopters and when the patient came 2 years later for the left eye the eyeball calculation was done using the ASRS calculator and the patient was doing well even the hyperopic error which was there it subsides. So to conclude always validate your measurement it acts as a quality check do not remove yourself from the process and spend extra time counselling the patient with short eyes and previous refractive surgery and always stay informed about the latest development. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, Tamil, I think that was a very uh, detailed uh, information and I have a feeling with our four of our talks if you have actually attended you would have uh, uh, most of the questions answered and I think uh, we really owe to Do Johnson & Johnson for uh, having ensured that we have more than 300 uh, odd observers at this uh, point of time. Uh, if you have time just one or two questions, uh, let me ask this question to Shreyaj. Do we need to have a topography for a premium IOL implantation? So uh, frankly uh, uh, topography or even when it comes to a, a premium uh, uh, you know uh, biometric device be it your Lenstar or IL Master 700 though they are all very useful and uh, definitely add uh, value to our measurements it is 
certainly not an essential prerequisite. Even in a very simple practice with just an immersion uh, A scan available, we can get uh, fairly accurate biometries available and with all the advanced uh, IOL power formulae available online like your Barrett formulae, your Barrett Torix, everything available online, you don't need any of these fancy equipment. Even incorporating posterior corneal astigmatism is all just a click away on your uh, computer and uh, although it helps to have these devices so that you have corroborative measurements, it's definitely not a prerequisite. You can easily go ahead uh, and uh, do these uh, treatments by just using uh, your uh, standard uh, formulae which are available on the internet. Uh, so the one other question we can take is, can we implant an eye enhance IOL in the second eye if the first eye is implanted with technis monofocal? I think uh, uh, Ramoti's talk, it came clearly across that uh, that is uh, something which he could think even with a multifocal IOL in one eye. But of course, multifocality, there is this question of neuroadaptation. So, uh, uh, eye hand should not be uh, a bad compromise at all because we need to keep in mind that one eye the patient has some limitation of intermediate vision. He has a good distance and near vision. In those eyes you could use uh, uh, eye hands in the second eye. And uh, But if you have a technis monofocal in one eye, you could definitely consider an eye hands in the second eye because it is going to give the patient that extra advantage of that intermediate vision. So as Ramurthy said that you could, he could just use readers for near vision and uh, do most of his normal activities for distance in near with a technis in one eye and a eye hands in the other eye. And uh, the last question I will ask Shreyesh to answer, what is the best option between symphony and technis and eye hands? I think either of you could tell the, uh, your answer. See, actually it depends upon the patient visual needs. I will place symphony, uh, tech, eye hands between the technis monofocal and the symphony. If the patient really wants uh, a good intermediate vision and I uh, will just go with the symphony. And if the patient is like, uh, it actually it depends upon the visual needs of the patient. And I feel that uh, eye hands falls between the technis monofocal and the symphony. Yeah, in other words, what she is saying to say is, a patient wants a multifocal vision for all ranges of vision. A symphony is a good answer and you might need to do a mono, micro mono vision if one eye the near is little inadequate. But if somewhere in between the patient is not able to spend as much for, for the symphony but he wants distance and some amount of intermediate vision you could use an eye hands and uh, so that should be the way to go. So I, I know there are a whole lot of questions you have uh, in mind. but. Uh, I think we have uh, largely answered it all for you all through the four different talks. I do hope we get this opportunity to meet on the same platform sometime again and uh, thanks a lot for being patient and uh, being with us for the, the last one and a half hours and thanks a lot to all the representatives of Johnson & Johnson and we do hope we have continued to have this wonderful association for years to come. Thank you very much. <laughs>